Hello, shalom, and welcome to Congressional Conversations, where we discuss the priorities of the New York Jewish community with members of the New York Congressional Delegation. I'm your host, Michael Miller, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the JCRC of New York, the Jewish Community Relations Council. And I'm thrilled to have as our guest, Congressman Tom Swazi, representing the third congressional district. And he serves as a member of the very powerful and influential House Ways and Means Committee, the Chief Tax Writing Committee of the House of Representatives. And he also serves on the Oversight and Tax Policy Subcommittees. And it is my pleasure to welcome Congressman Swazi. How are you doing today? Hey, Michael, thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's really great to see you again. Unfortunately, it's uh, virtual, but nonetheless, uh, it's, it's great to have you as a guest on Congressional Conversations. And I, I always like to start my conversations in these webcasts uh, with getting to know who it is that I'm speaking to. And you and I have known each other for quite a while, but many of our viewers do not. So if you can just tell us a little about your, your own background and how you chose to, to run for office. And while you're thinking about that, let me just indicate that uh, Congressman Swazi, when he was the county executive of Nassau County out of Long Island in New York, uh, traveled to Israel on one of our JCRC New York missions. And I had the pleasure of accompanying him on that, on that trip. It, it was an eventful trip, but we'll, maybe we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but First, uh, just uh, some of, of your personal background, if you wish to Michael, share. that was such a great experience, and thank you so much for doing That was in 2002. That was uh, during the Second Intifada, right after right. the massacre in, massacre in Hebron. And uh, I, no one was there. I remember we were at the King David Hotel. No one was there except for us. And I remember Deddy came to perform for us at night. So we had a, <laughs> a great experience. Anyway, enough of that. I, uh, I'm... Uh, uh, the youngest of five children. My father was born in Italy and my mother Irish and English. Uh, and my father really lived a great American success story. You know, came to the United States as a young boy, first kid in the neighborhood to go to college, uh, fought in World War II as a navigator on a B-24. Uh, really? Got, got the Distinguished Flying Cross with three Oak Leaf Clusters and came home and went to Harvard Law School on the GI Bill. So an Italian wow. immigrant going to Harvard <laughs> in the 1940s wow. was like unheard of. Yeah. And uh, he couldn't get a job at a law firm because Italians were very discriminated against in the 40s. You know, you think about, you know, everybody thought you were either a fascist because of Mussolini, who just fought the Italians. He was stationed in Italy. And, uh, or you were in the mafia or something like that. So it was very discriminated against against Italians in the 40s. So he went back to our hometown of Glen Cove and teamed up with another Italian guy to start a law firm and ended up running for city court judge. And he was the youngest judge in the history of New York State at 28 years old. Wow. So my father, you know, we would always say what a country and, you know, just really loved America and lived such a great success story. And uh, when I was growing up, there was a picture of my father with John F. Kennedy campaigning together. My father was running for New York State Supreme Court judge. Kennedy was running for president. And so that was that was normal. You know, the idea, oh, my father's with President Kennedy and here's Kennedy, this, this you know, idyllic figure. And so the idea of politics was a very natural, normal thing to me. And I was very idealistic as I, I'm still very idealistic. I was, I'm like Kennedy though, an idealist without illusions. And, uh, uh, I just always wanted to be in public service. Well, I went through a whole big thing. I was thought I was going to run for, you know, national office or something like that. I ended up running for mayor of my hometown. I was mayor for eight years. I was county executive for eight years. I ran for governor of New York against Elliot Spitzer for a Democratic mm -hmm. primary. That didn't turn out too well for me. I got crushed in that race. Didn't turn right. out very well for Elliot Spitzer didn't either. Didn't turn out too well for him either, right? <laughs> and then I lost my reelection for county executive to a guy named Ed Mangano. Right. He has since been convicted of bribery and corruption. So anybody's ever beaten me in an election, their life is over after this. It's beshert. You don't want to beat Tom Swazi, please. You can run against me, but don't beat me. <laughs> I was in the private sector after that. I'm trained as a lawyer at a CPA. I worked for uh, Arthur Anderson and Company. I clerked for a federal judge, uh, chief judge of the Eastern District. I worked for Sherman and Sterling. After I lost my race for county executive, I went back to the private sector. I worked for Lazard Frere. 
mm. and a law firm made some money. And then a complete fluke, my predecessor for Congress dropped out at the last minute. I, everybody, my phone started, I missed public service so much. I was so, I made money in the private sector, but I hated it. I mean, I was really bored. I wanted to do something meaningful. I thought I was gonna join the not-for-profit or something. I ran for Congress. I won a primary, I won the general election. Now, as you said, I'm on the most powerful committee, House Ways and Means Committee. And it's a great, I'm in the middle of history right now. I, I just say one other thing. When I was growing up, I always thought, boy, my father immigrated from Italy, my grandparents from Italy, and my, my grandmother on my mother's side from England. Uh, my family went through the depression. My father fought in World War II, the civil rights movement, you know, you know, the, the 60s. What's the big thing I'm gonna go through? What's my big struggling time? Well, this is it, <laughs> this is it right now. <laughs> But we're all right in the middle of it and how we act now looking at our values and and what we think is right and wrong and fighting for those values is so important right now and but let's talk about the right now the right now of course in, in great part is the pandemic um and uh new york has suffered greatly particularly during uh, the early stages of of the pandemic back in in march and april but it, it's still with us um and hospitals are still uh, uh packed and uh, intensive care units are, are overwhelmed, as are our frontline workers, of course. Uh, what, what, have, what have been your goals as a representative uh, from uh, Long Island uh, in, in Congress? And uh, Queens. And Queen, Peace of Queens. Um, um, what, what are your goals to bring back, and, and uh, you speak about fighting uh, for, for New York. Uh, what, what is this fight and what is the fight that you know that you can win to deliver for your constituents uh, within the framework of the, I'll say the COVID relief bill? We've got to bring money back to New York. I mean, that's, that's the big, big thing is bringing money back to New York. We need, need to get our fair share. When we were going through the whole uh, early stages of the crisis, there was a $100 billion pot that we put together for hospitals. Well, the New York hospitals, got less money than the Texas hospitals, even though the Texas hospitals had two and a half percent of the cases at the time. And we had 35% of the cases at the time because they were distributed based upon, you know, some population related Medicare formulas. And it was absurd. So I got every Democrat and every Republican from New York to sign a letter saying we need to create a special fund to distribute money based upon the rate of infection to the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services. We got a $10 billion special pot to be distributed based upon rate of infection. That got about $4 billion straight to New York hospitals at the time. That saved the New York hospitals just by working together, getting Democrats and Republicans from New York to fight for New York. New York is really you know, the biggest net donor to the federal government. We send more money to the federal government than we get back than any other state in the United States of America. And we're losing influence. You know, when I was born, there were 45 members of Congress in the House of Representatives out of 435, 45. Yes. That was 1962. Today, we have 27 members right. of Congress, and it's going to go down by one or two seats based upon this year's census. Correct. And they are constantly hitting New York. The Trump administration was hitting New York all the time, getting rid of the SALT deduction. We have to get the SALT deduction back. We're losing people in New York, and that will affect our population. That will affect our tax base. Uh, and the rest of us will be, le be left behind holding the bag. Uh, we, can't, we have got to get the SALT deduction back. So I'm always fighting for state and local aid. Big fight for us to get our fair share of that money. Fighting for formulas that distribute money to New York based upon our real needs. The rest of the country doesn't appreciate, you know, if you make $75,000 a year in my district, you're in trouble. If you're making $75,000 a year in Oklahoma or in Iowa or in North Dakota, you know, you live in a gated community with new granite countertops. So, you know, we have to educate constantly people how New York is affected and we need to work together to fight for New York to bring resources back to New York. So, but there are changes in Congress and changes in the executive branch. Uh, so the executive branch, uh, Joe Biden is president and in the Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer uh, is the majority oh, leader. Excuse me? That is so great for us to have Chuck Schumer in that position. Right. Akeem Jeffries has the third highest spot in the House of Representatives. And Joe Biden is, of course, sympathetic to New York's needs. We need to, you know, we have a big challenge for the next 20 years to figure out how do we make New York State more competitive and more attractive that people want to live here 
And how do we fight to get our fair share for New York during that process? It's a, it's a big challenge for us. Are you hopeful on the, 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 the SALT uh, deduction? Because uh, so many New Yorkers in the entire metropolitan area um, have, have been hit so hard uh, in there when they do their taxes around this time of year um, and just take a look at where they were and where, where they are. Do you think that uh, with the Democrats in, in control of the Senate and uh, the executive branch that there's a chance uh, for SALT to be uh, reinstated? There's a much better chance than there was, but we would have to constantly fight for it. We need to get all the Democrats, and that includes some of the progressive Democrats that don't necessarily understand why uh, SALT is so important to New York. They see, oh, just wealthy people are getting this benefit, when in reality, you know, if you make $150,000 in New York, you're not a wealthy person, you're a middle-class person in New York. Uh, and even the wealthy people that benefit from SALT, we need them to stay in New York. We don't want them going to Florida. We don't want them going to Arizona. We don't want them going to South Carolina. We need them here in New York to pay the taxes in New York. Uh, so, and, and it's not fair to pay taxes on the taxes you've paid already. Uh, and our whole system is set up with this deduction in place. It's been around for a hundred years. It's the first deduction in the federal tax code. We must get it back. So we need all the Democrats, progressive to moderate, and we need about 10 or 15 Republicans to help us as well. And then we got to get everybody in the Senate, which is going to require Chuck Schumer to make a deal to make sure he holds together that coalition of 50 senators. Yeah. Do you think that uh, on, the, on the same subject, though, I want to jump to another one in a second. Do you think that your Republican colleagues uh, in the, the state of New York, uh, the House representatives from the state of New York, I mentioned any specific names, uh, do you think that they would vote in, in favor of reinstating SALT? Many of them have in the past, not all of them. We need to hold their feet to the fire and we need to let them know there's political consequences for not doing it. Plus it, it helps their constituents. One of the big issues is how we're gonna pay for it because it costs the federal government money to have the SALT deduction. Well, why did they raise the high tax rate on the highest earners from 39.6 down to 37 when the economy was in such good shape? They didn't need to cut that rate and they didn't need to cut SALT. Uh, so we need to get it back. We need Republican colleagues. I already have several Republicans that have signed on to my bill to reinstate the SALT deduction. Uh, Chuck Schumer issued a companion bill, the exact same bill, the same day. He and I are working on this together. Great. Uh, we need to get the Republicans as well. Great. So within the framework of, of and thank you for that. Thank you very much. Uh, pr probably on behalf of, <laughs> of the vast majority of New Yorkers. Thank you. That's um, my number one. You know, I'm the lead on that bill. We passed it in the House last time. We couldn't get it through the Senate. Now with Chuck Schumer, I think we can get it through this. Well, you certainly have my prayers uh, that it'll achieve success. Um, within the framework of, of COVID, uh, we're, we're all wrestling with, with the vaccinations. Um, where can we get, do, do we qualify? Where can we get them? How quickly can we get them? Uh, how efficiently and will the supply uh, be there? What policies do we need in place to implement the and ensure uh, swift vaccinations for New Yorkers? Well, it's something I don't say that often, but we need to give the Trump administration some credit for having gotten the vaccinations approved as quickly as they did. However, they botched the rollout. We should have used the Defense Production Act to get as many supplies as we needed. Uh, the bottom line is all the frustration with the vaccines is there's just simply not enough vaccines yet. And so this administration, the Biden administration, is focused on dramatically increasing the supply of vaccines so that we can get, they say 100 million vaccines in 100 days, they're going for really 150 million or, or 200 million in 100 days. And they're ramping up production by using the Defense Production Act and getting the uh, producers to just make this the only priority they have. So I think you're gonna see over the next, I would say six weeks, by between now and March, you're gonna see a dramatic improvement in the rollout in the number of vaccines. Then we have to do all the local stuff as far as the logistics, as to where the locations are, how do you get senior citizens who don't know how to use uh, social uh, internet uh, uh, or the computer to get sign up? How do we get this out to the local people? And how do we build confidence, especially among people of color, that it's safe to use vaccines? Correct, those are all, all important uh, challenges and 
Uh, there are sentiments out there, particularly among, in communities of color, not to be vaccinated. Uh, so to the extent I'm on a, um, a, a panel just to deal with, with that issue on a webinar, um, and is really targeting, uh, not internal to the Jewish community, is targeting all communities, but particularly communities of color. And speaking of communities of color and the Jewish community, we've, we've both suffered uh, from um, a, 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 pl like a plague of, of hate uh, before the um, before the pandemic, uh, just a year ago, uh, there was a, a spike uh, in, in hate crimes, uh, particularly uh, anti-Semitic hate crimes uh, against our, our Jewish community. Um, even within your own district, if I'm not mistaken, the North Shore Hebrew Academy, there, there was a, a cyber um, a, a attack of anti-Semitic nature. What is and others, it? and others, the Holocaust uh, Memorial Center, my hometown of Glen Cove, other places, yes. So what, what, what Congress, what, what can be done, particularly in your position um, in, in Congress, uh, to do um, uh, for the United States of America to take every possible step uh, forward in order to, um, uh, to, to stop or attempt to stop uh, the, these acts of, of bigotry? Well, education is the most important thing. Enforcement is very, very important. And understand what the problem is. Anti-Semitism is real. It is not a made up thing, it is growing. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of different factors related to it. Number one is ignorance. Uh, the percentage of people that don't even understand what the Holocaust was or how many people were killed during the Holocaust is frightening. Uh, I, that's why I'm a big supporter of the Never Again Education Act. But I think yes. I'd like to start working and to make Holocaust education mandatory nationwide. When I was, uh, well, I was in the chambers when the insurrection happened, I, I saw the images of the guy, you know, the guy wearing the, the sweatshirt saying, you know, Camp Auschwitz. Yes. Yeah. Uh, people with Confederate flags, with Trump flags. And I mean, all, it's just, it's, it's terrifying. And we have to hold people accountable. Uh, we have to educate the general public. Uh, we have to understand that there are dark forces not only domestically, but strategic adversaries from foreign governments that want to sow civil unrest in our country that are using social media to try and promote uh, these type of hateful messages. So it's not only the bad local people in the United States of America with the white nationalists and the anti-Semites and the, you know, the, 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 the racists, uh, but it's foreign adversaries trying to sow civil unrest in our country that are using our freedom and using our social media uh, to try and sow these, these awful messages. And, and what should we be doing, what should Congress be doing regarding cyber attacks, uh, how, how the internet is used for nefarious purposes? Well, you know, this is so new to so many people, but I think that we have to look at uh, uh, having restrictions, quite frankly, uh, to hold the, the companies accountable. You know, newspapers are not allowed to publish misinformation. Uh, even local newspapers aren't allowed to publish, republish misinformation. We need to hold uh, tech companies responsible so that they cannot, so that they don't republish dangerous misinformation. That's a big task because it's such a broad network, but it's something we have to do. You know, when we were younger, uh, there were there were requirements for the network television stations to give people equal time to make sure things weren't done properly. In, re in return for the great privilege of using the airwaves, there were big restrictions on what could be published. We need similar things like that with technology. So we're going through that debate now and we need to pursue that more aggressively. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I'm sure you get a tremendous amount of support from our community and from other communities as well in, in, in that effort. Uh, but I, I think that our viewers might want to hear about your personal experiences on January uh, the, the 6th. Um, where, where were you, what, what happened, where were you taken to, et cetera? I was in the chamber uh, and I was there when they pulled Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer and others out of the room. Uh, they tried to conduct the rest of the meeting related to the debate for the certification of the election was stopped quickly by a Capitol Police officer. Yeah. Could you hear, could you hear in the chamber the uh, the chanting, the noise? Oh, uh, yeah. So, so, so the, they came on onto the, the speak onto the dais uh, 
onto the beamer <laughs> and said, uh, everybody, please look under your seats and pull out your gas mask. Mm. And then uh, the doors were locked in the chamber. We started hearing banging on the doors. Really? Uh, they started to evacuate the floor. I was up in the gallery uh, and all of a sudden you heard pop, 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 which I thought was gunfire, but it was somebody breaking through the windows of the main door in the back of the chamber where the president walks through. They say, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States of America. And uh, an army ranger, former army ranger, member of Congress said, Swaz, Swaz, check those doors over there, you know, to make sure they were locked where I was up in the gallery. And then we started evacuating and I was the furthest seat away from the evacuation point mm. just based upon where I was sitting. And when I was three quarters of the way around, we heard the woman, the, the gunfire, right. the woman yeah. shot in the behind the speakers, in the speakers lobby. And then you heard all the radios barking, you know, shots fired in the Capitol, shots fired in the Capitol, everybody down, everybody down. And so now I was stuck. Everybody had been evacuated from the floor, except for those guys that were there with their guns drawn. You saw that that picture with the piece of furniture across the door, and they're the guys are peeking yes. through the window and they got the guns yeah. drawn. That was right below me. Uh -huh. Those guys were still there. Just those were the only ones on the floor. There were about 20 of us up in the gallery still. We, we weren't certain we could go out into the hallway because we didn't know what was going on outside because of all the noise out there. The radios are barking. The Capitol Police have their guns drawn. We finally get out about, it, was, it seemed like an eternity, but it's probably another 10 minutes later. And we go outside and there's all the guys, all the people on the floor spread eagle with the guns drawn, you know, the, the cops have the guns drawn on them, holding the rioters, uh, the mobs, the mob, uh, you know, they'd been arrested. And then we were taken through a labyrinth, you know, to, to go to a secure location. Uh, you know, then I was taken into a, the, the secure location with, and I went back into the room in the back that I knew the location. And I was in there with my colleague, Jamie Raskin, who was the, leading the impeachment uh, right. uh, 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 prosecution. His, his son had just committed suicide a week yeah. before. Right. You know, brilliant guy, Jamie, went to Harvard, Harvard under, undergraduate, Harvard Law School. His son was at Harvard Law at the time. Just, I can't imagine how he was surviving all this trauma we were going through. And there he was trying to comfort his daughter who was there with him oh. after going through this whole thing. It was just really amazing. But my big focus was we have to get back to the chamber. We have to certify this election tonight. Yeah. We can't let it slip. And we did, and, and I was there till 3.15 in the morning that, that next morning, and we did our duty, but you know, it was really a that. very dramatic time, very sad time yeah. in our history. Yeah, again, thank you for, for doing what you, you have done um, and your colleagues as well uh, for upholding uh, the great democracy that this country is. Um, and it's very interesting as well um, that there's the expression that there are no atheists in, in foxholes. Um, so at, at that time, no doubt, uh, there was no, nobody was asking, are you a Republican or are you a Democrat? Uh, and the, the spirit of ensuring the safety and security of, of every, the well being of everyone was, was primary. Um, but that also speaks to the importance of bipartisanship. And one of the issues that we're concerned about in, in, in the Jewish community, of course, is Israel that Israel remain a bipartisan issue. How do we do that? How do we ensure that? I mean, there are fewer, uh, more strong supporters of Israel in Congress than, than yourself, uh, Congressman Swazi. Uh, so, and, and I know that you recognize the importance of bipartisanship on that issue, but how do we ensure it? Uh, again, education is such an important factor. Uh, we need to constantly be educating our colleagues about the importance of our relationship with Israel, about its history, about why it's important for the US. It's not just important, to, it's not just a nice thing to do. It's good for America to have this partner. Uh, and that goes, you know, we, we need to make sure that the progressives in the Democratic Party are educated. Uh, and we need to make sure that the rest of us uh, continue to stay strong along with our Republican colleagues to support Israel in a bipartisan fashion. I'm the vice chairman of the Problem Solvers Caucus, 28 mm. Democrats, 28 Republicans. We meet together on a regular basis to try and find common grounds on, thing, on things. We got common ground, massive, overwhelming bipartisan support on the Never Again Education Act, which is not Israel per se, but it's about the Holocaust and it's yes. about education. Uh, we need to constantly be 
keeping a big tent on this issue, uh, especially watching our left flank with the progressives to understand that in fact, uh, the Jewish people of Israel have been persecuted uh, for a long, long time and why this homeland was created in the first place. Uh, and to talk about the values that are so strong uh, in Israel. They're more to tolerant in Israel than they are in America. They're more progressive when it comes to healthcare and other issues in Israel than they are in America. Uh, we need to make sure that our colleagues uh, understand that. On, on the, thank you, on, on the optimism gauge, um, how, how do you feel about the potential uh, during this particular two-year time frame? We don't know what's gonna be happening two years from now, but during this two-year time frame, the Democrats hold, uh, the White House Democrats hold the Senate uh, barely, but they do, and the Democrats uh, uh, narrow, more narrow, and, and uh, uh, Congresswoman Deteni is, is being sworn in, uh, so again, it's narrower by one more seat, um, but while this two-year period um, is, is, uh, is there, um, are, are you hopeful that there will be greater bipartisanship uh, to um, advance the interest of, of all Americans, whether you're Democrat or Republican, whatever faith you are, or what, whatever ethnicity you are? I think everybody's sick of all politicians, and they want the politicians to deliver. They want them to actually work together to actually help people. And I think that I'm hearing that a lot from my Democratic colleagues about like, we have to do things that actually affect people's lives. It can't be about messaging. It can't be about, uh, you know, we're right and you're, they're wrong. We have to get things done. And because the majority is so thin, razor thin in the Senate, very small in the House, uh, we have to work together to get things done. This president, President Biden, I think, not only you know talks the good game of bipartisanship, but he knows about politics. He knows about politics. He knows about uh, policy. He knows about people. He's got great relationships. He's a, a wonderful man, but he's also an effective politician. And he's going to be able to get people to work together. And for those, if people don't work together, he'll hold them accountable. You know, every every president has opposition from the other party trying to cut their legs off. I mean, that's just. That's just the name of the game. Everything, oh, everybody picked on Trump. Oh, everybody picked on Obama. Every president gets picked on by the other party. That's, that's life. That's the way it works. But if you're a skilled politician who actually understands the policy and has relationships with people and a good reputation of being a good person, you can get stuff done. So I think that this president, everybody talks about, oh, Joe Biden, you know, he's look at his age, you know, look at his, look at his speech making. He's going to be a very consequential president because he understands the politics, the policy, and the people, and knows how to get stuff done. And he wants to work across party lines. He wants people to work together. And if you won't work together with him, he's going to figure out how to get it done without you. So, because he knows how to do it. So I'm I'm optimistic about this president. Uh, you know, every midterm election, things change yes. dramatically, yes. Uh, especially for uh, the president in power. My colleagues represent, understand that. They realize we have to get things done for the people. E even between the, the moderates and the progressives within the Democratic Party? Can that be bridged? Yes, it can be. I'm working very hard on that myself. I told you about the problem solvers bridging between the Democrats and Republicans. I'm also involved with a thing called the Labor Caucus, a, the newly formed caucus. I'm a co-chairman of it. If there's one thing Democrats and Republicans should agree upon, but if there's certainly one thing that Democrats, progressive and moderates should agree upon is that if you're willing to go to work every day and you're willing to work 40 or 50 hours a week and you're willing to work 48 or 50 weeks a year, you should make enough money so you can have a decent life. That's not happening. We've created enormous wealth in America from the late 1980s on. We've, the Dow Jones has gone up 1,500%, 15 times. The GDP has gone up 800%, eight times. But workers' wages have gone up less than 20%. We need to continue to create enormous wealth in our country. That's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with being successful and being capitalist. That's a good thing. But we have to share that success with the people who go to work every day. And I don't care whether you're progressive or whether you're uh, a conservative. In America, you work hard, you make enough money, so you can buy a house, you can educate your kids, you can buy health insurance, and you can retire without being scared. That's not true for a lot of people. 
That's where Trump came from. That's where Bernie Sanders came from because there's so much frustration. We need to recreate that American dream in our country again. Democrats need to unify behind that message. I can't thank you enough uh, for that encouraging word. Um, I can't thank you enough for being my guest on Congressional Conversations. And I can't thank you enough for being um, a, a wonderful friend uh, over quite a number uh, of years, but not only a friend uh, from a, on a personal professional level, but I think a, uh, as well, a, uh, a dear friend of, of our Jewish community and uh, wish you great success during the course of the 117th uh, Congress. I think that's what we're up to. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, that, that certainly JCRC is there to be at your service as, as you are of service to er all your constituents and I, I, I'm sure all New Yorkers and, and all Americans. Uh, is there a, a last word, Congressman, that you'd like to, to share with our viewers, uh, many of whom are Jewish or some of whom are not? Well, Michael, I just want to thank you. You're such an effective person. Uh, JCRC is such a wonderful organization. Uh, my trip to Israel that I went in 2000 uh, and two was so educational for me. Uh, the advocacy that your group does is so fantastic. And I will always partner with you. I will always work together with you uh, to stand up for Israel, to stand up for the Jewish community, to stand up for the larger community, and to work together to try and make our country a better place to live in. I'm very optimistic that we can do it. Don't underestimate how powerful you are as a person, how, the people, how powerful the people that are watching are because they care about our country and they're willing to work hard to fight for our country, to build something big, to build something beautiful, uh, to build a great cathedral in Europe in the 1500s, it had to be brick by brick by brick. That's what it takes to build something beautiful, which is our country and our world, person by person, piece by piece. Uh, together, we'll accomplish the things that you and I share in common as goals. Uh, I'm very confident we can do it together. So thank you so much. To everybody watching. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tom Swazi, for joining us uh, and uh, for always uh, being a, an uplifting uh, voice and uh, an inspirational voice as well. Uh, and I very much want to thank all of our viewers who are watching. Uh, and if you want to learn more about some of the issues that were discussed today between myself and the congressman, you can check our our JCRC New York uh, website, and there you will find JCRC New York's focus on communal priorities. It's available on jcrcny.org. You can also go to the congressman's uh, website and, and to see what priorities the, the congressman is working on, many of which we've touched on today. And we look forward to seeing you next time on Congressional Conversations. Thank you, Todaraba, and shalom uh, to all. Bye-bye. Thanks, Michael. Thanks.